The best way to understand hyperfunctional singing is to jump on stage in a really loud rock band. I don't recommend learning to sing in a really loud band. That's a lot like learning to swim in a tsunami, but that's exactly what I did. For 15 years, I made a living singing in a rock band, logging over 3,000 gigs. Now, I'm proud to say in that period, I got out of there without any pathologies. Now, I know that's anecdotal, so what I'm going to share with you now is the result of the teaching experience I've had since. It's been 39 years of research and observation and individual casework, working with just now over 4,000 individuals, of which 3,000 I've identified as being hyperfunctional. This breaks down in gender like so, and this is from professional A-listers to amateur, and the breakdown in age has been a huge spectrum from about eight to 80. Now I've noticed in the past 200 years, vocal pedagogy has been highly sort of focused on acoustics and anatomy and physiology. And it kind of suggests that ignorance is at blame here. We all tend to bring out our, our medical models and point towards muscles and organs and how things relate and harmonics and formats as if the singer knew more, their behavior would change. And over the years, I've noticed a psychological profile, if you will, of hyperfunctioning singers. They tend to be self-conscious, uncomfortable with vulnerability, and have negative narratives running, but also they tend to be impatient. All this to me doesn't sort of point towards ignorance, it more points towards inhibition. And over those years, what I've come to find is that all functional disorders have a psychogenic component. Let me put it this way. I've never seen a muscle tension that didn't have permission from its owner to be there. And so to give you another comparison, if we take inhibition and couple it with surrender, we get a hypo function. And if we take the same inhibition and couple it with defiance, well, then we get hyperfunction. And that's why I think the attention on the organ down here is misplaced. I think the organ to blame for that behavior is upstairs. And not only is it just the organ, but the interplay between conscious and unconscious drivers. You can fill in any thought you want in those little thought bubbles there. I got kicked out of chorus when I was 12. My parents don't respect my singing. I've heard them all. And the point is they all amount to sing and don't sing. And it's that contrasting, that confliction going on upstairs that tends to then send down bad information to those muscles of phonation, of which then the sensory neurons send information back that the end result is not wanted. This is the cycle I'm talking about, where we have an intention, perfectly good one, and then we have a processing error. And in that processing error, we get a bad result. This cycle also happens to define neuroplasticity. That's a good thing, right? And that's exactly what Dr. Kleber gave a keynote address on here at the Voice Foundation in 2018. The gist of his address was that trained singers have an ability to predict ahead of producing the sound and therefore an adjustment is made pre-phonation and a confirmation then of the correct sound occurs. But the point is, this is exactly the same as a hyperfunctioning cycle as well, because a hyperfunctioning singer will make a prediction of failure, and the brain will make an adjustment, and then the confirmation occurs of that failure. And round and round we go in this hyperfunctioning loop. Now, I refer to this as a cranial loop simply because those primary nerve connections for phonation are just that, cranial nerves, number 10 number nine and number 12 through the larynx, the pharynx and the tongue. Auxiliary to this, where the hyperfunctioning singer has extracurricular activity is with the eyes, with the facial expression muscles, with the jaw and with the mastoid and with the trapezius muscles. And I'm here to tell you that each and every one of you has already in your studio or in your clinic the most hypersensitive, highly evolved biofeedback tool ever. 
and that is your client's own hand. Let me give you some examples of how to put this wonderful tool to use. Something as innocent as the eyes gazing up when singing higher can indicate indirect influence going on. And so I'll take my glasses off here. You take their fingers, place them over their eyes, and ask them to feel the wiggle beneath. As they sing, ask them to hold the eyes in a fixed position. They will feel the wandering. Ah, Simply take the index finger and place it in front of the chin so the singer is aware of the jutting and clenching going on. So first thing I have people do is to take the flat palm and place it right on their forehead. And they can feel the eyebrows wanting to move through there. Getting, gaining that muscle independence is key. And then I'll have them do what I call the home alone face, where they're just taking both palms, placing it on the sides here, to keep their face as passive as possible. Ah. So take their hands and just wrap them around their neck, keeping this loose. And then I ask them to make a very small circle with their nose from the top of the hands. We don't want the whole body gyrating. And you will see when you ask them to sing that a circle becomes a triangle and then a rectangle and then a parallelogram, anything but a circle. It's from these small occipital muscles back here that we want the rotation. And that requires that the trapezius and the mastoid just relax. Ah, and that, of course, is just a fraction of the things we can suggest to singers to help them break those vicious cycles that they're caught in. So in conclusion, just want to leave you with three points. And I mentioned infancy because a baby's only defensive mechanism is to wince and turn their head away. So when a singer claims that this kind of behavior he's exhibiting with his head tense and reared back squeezing his face is passion or his style, you can remind him that's merely his inner baby coming up to the surface. And I should know, I made a living as a crybaby for 15 years. My name is Mark Baxter. Happy to speak with anybody further about this. I can be reached at this website. I thank you for your time.